Okay. So, so once again, as I was saying, I welcome you. The reason why we we are having these lectures is, you know, I'm I'm having also my monologue lectures. By monologue, I'm saying the lectures that I'm running down, I'm I'm conducting when I'm free during selected days. And one of the monologue lectures that I recently conducted on AFM was the revision on March June uh, March 2020 exams. On in that particular lecture, what I want you to note is the question on aging current risks, which is question number two. It, it should be barely on Kanban or so if I'm not if I'm not wrong with the inter, with the pronunciation of the of the of the name. Make sure you go through that video of particular importance. It, it, it was the video on aging a foreign currency receipt. The main takeoffs in that video was the fact that if you are aging using futures and options contracts, the company was a euro-based company, and we are aging using futures and options contracts together with forwards. But the issue was the futures and options contracts were denominated in euros, meaning they were denominated in domestic currency. So I emphasized on how you then assume the market position. It was that part which I really, I really want you to replay the video if you haven't. You can access it from our AFM class group, WhatsApp class group, or if you have subscribed to my YouTube channel, you can as well access it from my YouTube channel. So it is still fine. It's AFM revision, March 2020. Question number one was in March. It was well, it, it was the ordinary majors and acquisitions, computations, metrics, computation of additional value created, valuing the target firm, the value of the merged firm using free cash flows, TC, free cash flows to the firm, determination of the, I mean, incorporation of business and financial risk to the A beta, to the beta of the merged firm so that you can calculate the weighted average cost of capital for the merged firm. This being important because you need it to discount cash flows that are to arise as a result of the merger. Okay, so that particular video is so important. Make sure I play that video. And then the second issue, which I always refer to, though I know I, I say it over and over again, is the issue of is the issue of um, assignment. It's the issue of assignments on Atlant's uh, first intuition learning management system. You know, partnering with first intuition learning management system was a very important milestone because it 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 meant that in this, this region, Southern Africa, or even Africa at large. We, are, we now have access to an award-winning learning management system for ACCA courses. So important. So we have enrolled you for ACCA courses, for, for CBE courses. And for CBE courses, because your exam is CBE, so it's important to make sure that you are practicing answering those exams in a platform that you are likely to come across in the actual exam, which is CBE. Now, you, you have CBE courses for every exam, as you can see, and our exam of interest is financial management. So if I open as a student, it means here is how you are going to view this. Once you are enrolled with Atlantis resources for the CBE courses, there is an introductory video where we are explaining examiner's verbs, how to present an easy to mark script and tips. Make sure you go through all this material and understand it. And then proceed to go to mock one. Mock one, it's a very important mock. You take it. I can't click take it because I'm not a student. No wonder why it's deactive here. But before you take mock one, make sure you have set aside three hours, 15 minutes for the mock because it's timed. The, the reason, the purpose of this mock is 
it's on CBE, so you are being trained on your CBE skills, number one. Number two, it helps you to identify gaps in knowledge and whether you are able to properly manage your time. Are you able to finish an AFM exam on time? And then after marking it, you self-mark by coming to the top right in corner here. There's a marking tab. Once you mark it, play these debriefing videos. These debriefing videos, we, we have gone through the mock. We have gone through the same mock here, outlining the best approach to answering these questions. If you had got any issues of marking, for example, you didn't know how many mark, marks to award yourselves, the same is again included in the debriefing video. So you can actually satisfy yourselves whether you've answered the exam well or not. So it's so, so important. And after doing mark mock number one, don't then jump to mock number two. No, after completing mock number one, learn from the mistakes in this particular mock and do to practice questions from the revision kits, be it BBP revision kit or Kaplan revision kit, on areas where you realize that there are gaps in knowledge. Do as many questions as possible, and then when you are done, proceed to mock number two. And, in, and incrementally, the support we are giving as we proceed through the mocks decreases because we want to we want this to mirror the actual exam possible so you'd notice that especially as you get to mock number three we don't even have debriefs per se but we have got our closing remarks here where we went through everything that you now need for the final five days prior to the exam uh, so that you keep it up as soon as you answer mock number three it is my expectation and hope that you have the subject in the bag. Now, this CBE platform is paid for. It's paid for. You enroll with Atlantic Resources. You know, it's a matter of just uh, WhatsApp us on the number that we shall share on your screen. And it's a matter of after doing that, enroll, and there you go. OK, uh, you may say, Maslin, Say, is it, is it, do we only have CBE for this particular semester? Because we got this platform uh, first week of, of August, so we couldn't enroll you on everything. We just chose to enroll you on CBE because this is, was so salient to your upcoming exams. But there are also full courses there. Full courses, suppose you are, you are doing, you intended to do another subject, to write another subject in December and you want to enroll with Atlantic Resources. These are now full courses. Let's say you want to do APM. If you, are not, if you now want to do APM, you, 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 you don't just get CBE like what you, what you noticed. You got full course from September to December to, to November 12. And this is the full course. So you can see full course has got 0%, 0%, 0% on everything because we haven't started. Once you are starting the full course, you start by reading introduction. There are videos on introduction as to how you proceed as you are utilizing the platform. And then there are study materials. Study material, there are course notes. This is available on every subject, even from applied skills subjects. There is question bank and there is study text. Everything is digitalized in the platform. So you then proceed in topic. These are topics. So as you are doing topics, like you are doing in other environmental and ethical issues, we give you the notes, we give you video lectures on that topic. So these are video lectures on the topic. And then on the, on the right plane here now, there are questions from the question bank that I have shown you earlier. So as you do questions from the question bank, there will be debriefing videos like this debrief to question number 14, debrief to question number 31. These are the questions which we have chosen for you here to, to do as you understood this. Once you complete this, it will then say 100% here. So we have pre-populated videos for you so that you can, you can self-assess yourself and mark it for yourself because as soon as you do, you mark and you play the, our recordings, our 
videos t guiding you on how best we're supposed to approach the question and where you could earn easy marks and everything. So you have that through to the end, it's so that there are mocks. At the end here, you do notice there are mock exams, which are equally CBE. These are different from the mocks that I have shown you earlier. These are mocks for those who are doing full courses. So you may say, say, do we have access to this? Why, why is we are writing in September? You no longer have access to this because you were registered just two weeks ago. And what is of, of importance to you is now the CBE mocks. Those three mocks I had alluded to earlier. And then for supplementary revision, make sure you'll be playing my videos that I send in our WhatsApp class groups and also make sure you complete revision kit. Don't get to the exam without completing the revision kit. By revision kit, I'm saying either BPP or Kaplan. If we have given you the question bank, like for APM, we have given you question bank and we, we have given you this revision planner. The revision planner details how you go through the question bank and these debriefing videos. But you may not access these debriefing videos because you are not enrolled on the full course. In this case, you have to play our videos from uh, other from from WhatsApp class groups. So that one is done. Let me open today's discussion. I want us to discuss gauging interest rate risk and with particular emphasis on caller on options. Why call on options? Because these are things which, if examined, uh, even though I had sent an earlier video on this, I still am still persuaded that, as you say, it would make strategic sense. You know, this is the question I was talking about about value on company. The question for March 2020. There's a video for this. Make sure you play that video, please about the Balion uh, company, this one. So I, I, there's a video where we did this question in full. So allow me to close that. It's, a, it's accessible from my, in my, in my, um, <clears throat> in my uh, YouTube channel. Now, this is June 2015, Yilang company. Remember, we did this question. So let us see which other question we are yet to do. It's June 2015, right? Bento, that's another question there. Now we want to jump to question number four because question number four is on the aging interest rate risk using, it includes connotations of caller on options. It is that which I want to, to outline more in this particular discussion. So let me read the question. It's saying, for a number of years, Daikon Company has been using forward rate agreements to manage its exposure to interest rate fluctuations. Recently, the chief executive officer attended a talk on using exchange traded derivative products to manage. So they have been using forward rate agreements. So they now want to use exchange traded derivatives to manage risks. She wants to find out, so this is the question. She wants to find out by how much the extra cost of borrowing detailed below can be reduced using interest rate futures, options on interest rate futures and caller on options to manage interest rate risk. Right. And a caller on options to manage interest rate risk. She asks that detailed calculations for each of the three derivative products be provided and a recent recommendation to be made. So she wants you to calculate the aging outcomes for this. But this time what she's doing is she wants to know by how much the extra finance cost can be reduced if you age using interest rate futures, options on interest rate futures, caller on options and it is now Daikon is expecting to borrow 34 million in five months time. So it's expecting to borrow in five months time. So exposure period is between now and end of five months. It expects to make full repayment of the loan in 11 months time. 
So it's expecting to borrow in five months' time and to make full repayment in 11 months' time. This implies that the loan is for six months because we are borrowing in five months' time and making a full repayment in 11 months' time. So the loan period is six months. Assume that, assume it is 1 June today, Daikon can borrow funds at LIBOR plus 70 basis points. So the, 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 that's, that's what Daikon can borrow. It can borrow funds at LIBOR plus 70 basis points. LIBOR is currently 3,6. So by LIBOR, we mean to the current spot rate of interest. But Daikon expects that interest rates may increase by as much as 80 basis points. In other words, when, by, when they say interest rate may increase by as much as 80 basis points, they are referring to the LIBOR. They are simply saying the LIBOR can increase by as much as 80 basis points. The following information and quotes from an appropriate exchange are provided on LIBOR-based dollar futures and options. The three month December futures. Now, why are they saying December? You may you may notice they are saying today is one June. So you want to borrow in five months' time. So let us count our fingers. It's June, July, August, September, October. So you want to borrow on 31st of October. So when you are one when you want to age using futures, you can only age with futures which expire after October. In this case, you can age with December futures. So no wonder why they are saying three months December futures are currently quoted at 95.84. Size is 0.1%, and the tick value is 25%. You now understand what we mean by tick. Tick, we mean the smallest movement in interest rate. And so interest rate may move favorably or unfavorably, and the potential loss that you you are exposed to by that movement is called the tick value. So it's $25 on each tick. So if it if it ticks by three ticks, it will be $75. And this is pay on those three ticks. Options on three months, dollar futures, contract size 1 million, and you are also given the tick value to be 25. Options premiums are in annual percentages. Initial assumptions. It can be assumed that that settlement for both futures and option contracts are at the end of the month. That basis diminishes to zero at a constant rate until contract matures and time intervals can be counted in months. That margin requirements can be ignored and that if options are in the money, they will be exercised at the end of the age instead of being sold. Further, further issues. In the talk, the CEO was informed of the following issues. So, uh, number one, futures contracts will be marked to market daily. The CEO wondered what impact of this would be if 50 contracts, which were bought at 95,84 on 1 June, and 30 futures contracts, which were sold on 95,61 on 3 June, uh, based on the December futures contracts given above, the closing settlement prices are given, uh, are given below for the four days. Okay, so as I told you that futures market, it's a stock exchange. So a stock exchange opens in the morning and closes at the end of the day. So the movement in, in interest rates during the period can make can give you a loss or a profit and you, are, you either pay or you are paid. This process is called daily settlement or mark to market. So I shall come to mark to market shortly. Daikon will need to deposit funds into a margin account with a broker for each contract they have opened. And this margin will need to be adjusted when the contracts are marked to market daily. The, 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 it is likely that options contract will be exercised at the end of the age period, unless they've reached expire. Instead, they are more likely to be. It is unlikely that options contract will be exercised at the end of the age period, unless they have reached um, expire. Instead, they may be, they are more likely to be sold and positions closed. All right. Notice 15 marks. Based on the three aging choices available to DICON and the initial assumptions given above, draft a response to the chief executive office the request made in the first paragraph of the question. 
So the CEO's request was made in the first paragraph of the question. So what we need to understand is, we need to understand what that request was about. So the CEO's request in the first paragraph of the question, this is the request they are saying, she won extra finance cost of borrowing. Detailed below can be reduced using interest rate futures options on interest rate. So, so you can, you can, you can, you know, you you can, you can actually copy. You know, in an exam, in some of this stuff, you can, you can copy it like this. You can copy from the exhibit where it is written and, and paste it where you are answering it from. Like in this case, we, we are answering it here. So instead of she wants, you can simply say CEO wants. This is the CEO. CEO wants to find out how much the extra finance cost of borrowing. Uh, you, you, you can't say now detailed below. You now say how much the extra finance cost of borrowing uh, can be reduced. You just say can be reduced using when using interest rate features uh, to manage interest rate risk so so you have current interbank rate current interbank rate current libor let's say current libor current libor is 3.6% and then increase increase by 80 basis points. They're saying the LIBOR can increase by 80 basis points. That is the fear. What, so it increases to what? It increases to this. Remember, 80 basis points is 0.8% plus 0.8%. So it will be 4,44%. So they, they, they are afraid that it can increase to 4,44%. 4, 4.40% if it increases by 80 basis points. Now, because it increases by 80 basis points, uh, this is, uh, you know, I can, let me insert another, 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 another line here. Allow me to insert another line. This is like a six month loan, six month loan obtainable obtainable in five months time five months time because they are saying today is one june and we are going to get a loan in five months time and this loan will be repaid in 11 months time so in other words the loan is a six month loan and the loan is how much you check the loan is 34 million so you put 34 million Right. So what will be the extra finance cost? Extra finance cost. Extra finance cost. Now, if if, if LIBOR increases by 80 basis points, it means the extra finance cost is 0.8% because it increases by that amount times 34 million multiply by 6 over 6 over 12. This is the extra which is equal to 34 million times 0.8% times 6 over 12. So extra finance cost is 136. So the CEO, if you come to the question, he's saying she wants to know, you know, this area which is shaded in yellow here, yeah, which which where my case is, yes. Yeah. Is saying she wants to know by how much extra finance cost detailed below can be reduced if we if we edge. So she wants to know how by how much this amount here 136 can be reduced when we use interest rate futures, options on interest rate futures, and caller on options. So it's a matter of answering a set. 
So you now say futures the edge. The edge. Because you are a borrower, the market position that you assume is you sell. In other words, you go short. I said you borrow by selling. For imagine, for example, if you want to borrow money using debentures, you sell debentures. You can't say you buy debentures when you're borrowing. No. So if you are aging interest rate using interest rate futures, you go short or you sell December futures because we want to we want to borrow in, in on 31st of, of October. So the statement should should first go like the firm. The firm goes short or goes short in brackets sell goes short or sell on December futures December interest rate futures contracts now interest rate futures contracts now the, the firm goes short on December on 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 December interest rate futures contracts now. So what do you do? You then say a number of contracts. You still remember this is how you, you go about it. Number of contracts. Number of contracts. Uh, it's 34 million and December contracts. Notice. We are say, we are told that the three month December futures contracts, they have a contract size of 1 million and you want to borrow 34 million. But 34 million is a six month loan, and these are three months December contracts. So you roll them over. So when you are calculating number of contracts, then you say 34 million over 1 million. This is the contract size. Then you say multiply by six months, which is the loan period, divided by three months, which is the contract period, because you roll these contracts over. So equals 34 over 1 times 6 over 3. 68. So number of contracts is 68. And what else do you have to do when you are you aging using interest rates? I said you you calculate basis. Basis. And basis, it's basis when you are calculating basis, you say spot price spot price by spot price we mean uh, today's interest rate current libor in futures market what we mean by spot is the libor or interbank rate but but futures futures notation we 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 we, we, we notation for futures is discount basis notation like 95,84 so instead of saying 3,6 you put it in discount basis, which is equals 100 minus 3,6. That's the current, which is 96,4. And then you say December futures price, December futures price. Uh, what is the price for December futures contracts? It's 95,84. So you come here and say 95. 0.84. So with this, you now have how many basis? Today's one June. So it's June, July, August, September, October, November, December. That's seven month basis. Seven month basis. Basis means movement in movement in interest rates. So it's 96,4 minus 95,84, which is 56 basis. Now, this is 56 basis, but we are given by the examiner that tick size is 0 0,1. So you can divide this by 0,1% because these are percentages. So you can divide this by 0 0,1. So you say O, 0 0,56 over, over 0 0,1, 0 0,01. It, it gives you 56 tick. So this is like 56 ticks. Are you getting it? So it, it, it is expected to tick 56. So what you then have to do is, you now say an expired basis, an expired 
basis. Remember, an expired basis, it's November and December. November and December, because we are exposed between now and the time we take the loan, which is 31st of October. So November and December, we are, we, it's, it's, it's an expired basis. So this becomes equals two over seven, two over seven multiplied by 0 0.56. So an expired basis equals, equals this multiplied by two, divided by seven. So an expired basis equals 16 or 0 0.16. So why do we calculate an expired basis? We calculate an expired basis because we want to determine expected closing futures price. Expected closing futures price. So this is expected closing futures price. You now know how we call it, we calculate it. We say equals October spot, October, October spot. Uh, as you can see, that basis, these basis are decreasing less an expired basis, an expired basis. So what are we, what are we doing here now? October spot, October spot is this one. If interest rate increase by 80 basis points between today and October, so this becomes October spot. If interest rate, if interest increase by 80 basis points to 4,4, so October spot is 4,4. So in in futures notation, you don't write it as 4,4. You say 100 minus 4,4. That October spot and then minus 0 0.16, which is an expired basis. So you say equals open bracket 100 minus 4,4 close bracket minus an expired basis. So closing futures price is 95,44. That's the closing futures price. Now, if you want now, why do we calculate closing futures price? Because you entered the futures market by selling, you exit the futures market by buying. So you can now say outcome. Let us see. You entered the futures market by selling price. When you entered the futures market, you ended by selling, and the selling price was 95,84. And you exit the futures market by buying price buying price and by buying price we we call it closing futures, futures price buying price is closing futures price so in this case this is the buying price so if you sell by 8 by 95,84 and you buy by 95,44 clearly you have made a profit profit from futures because your buying price is less than the selling price. So the profit from futures is equals to this minus this. And you get 0 0,4. We can say, oh, 40 ticks. You now understand how we calculate 40 ticks. We simply say the basis, 0 0,4 basis, divided by 0,01%. So you get 40 ticks. So, what you simply do is extra finance cost, extra finance cost, which the CEO wants to know how it can be reduced. So extra finance cost, we calculated it, it's 136. And the CEO wants to know by how much this will be reduced if we age using futures. So if this is a cost, so you then say less profit from futures. Profit from profit from futures. Extra finance cost less profit from futures. Uh, profit from futures is 40 ticks. And on each tick, being told by the examiner that on each tick you gain $25. So what you simply do is you say how many contracts do you have? You have 68 contracts. Of the 68 contracts, each contract moved by 40 ticks. 
and on each tick you were you were gaining twenty five dollars. So you say equals minus. Why are we subtracting profit? Because this is a cost. So if it's a profit, you subtract it. Equals sixty eight times forty ticks times twenty five dollars. So this is this is this is the reduction in extra finance cost which the CEO wants. So you get this figure, which is called net extra finance cost. Net extra finance cost. So the net extra finance cost in this case is 68. Now this 68, in this particular question, we have calculated it using ticks. You can calculate it using the way you know it, that this one is percent. So you can simply say, or, this you can say 68 contracts times on each contract you gain now much 0.4 percent so it's 0 0.004 times how many, what is the contract size 1 million times the contract period 3 over 12 you can still get the same answer here to say equals 68 contracts times because you might not be given the tick value or the tick size. So this is how you would calculate it, where, where I'm saying all. Oh, 68 contracts times uh, 0 0.004. So uh, because I have, I have reduced the zero, if this is 0.4%, so it's 0 0.004 times 1 million times, oh, I say, I need to say times 1, 1 million times 3 over 12. Are you not seeing we still get 68,000 here? So this is so this is how you can easily calculate it as well if you are not given the tick size. So this is about features the age. So you are already done when, when you are given features the age. Now we are going to the next which is options. Options on interest rate futures interest rate futures you know what what this implies is instead of going on options you can choose to exercise the option or itself or to choose whether to exit market at closing futures price or exit the market at option price you choose whether to exit market at closing futures price or to exit the market at uh, op at, at option price. So you need to understand that what is the exposure here? Because you are a borrower, a borrower, you, you, you buy put options. There are call options and there are put options. You need to know which one do you, do you go for. If you are a borrower, you buy put options. So that is a very good statement to say the term buys December put options now. It's a very good statement. The term buys December put options now. Because you are you are a borrower, you buy December put options now. Uh, then number of contracts. Number of contracts is still 68 as before. Number of contracts is still 68. So what we then have to do is, is we want to exercise options on interest rate futures. So what you do is you say strike price. Strike price. This time we are a borrower. I remember I did a question with you when you were a lender. So there are two strike prices, 95,5 and 96. So let us use both. 95,5 and 96. These are the two strike prices. So what you then have to do is you then say closing futures price. Closing futures price. What is the closing futures price? The closing futures price is what we have calculated. We have calculated it to be 95,44. So you come here and say 95, 95,44. 
that's close in futures price, 95,44. So please pay attention to what I'm now going to say. And this is what you have to ask yourself when you are doing questions on this. You, you ask yourself this, but I, I am a borrower, meaning I sell. Get it right. I am a borrower, meaning I sell. You get that? Now, the question is, do I sell at 95,5 or do I sell at 95,44? Clearly, I make a profit if I sell at 95,5 because these are higher than 95,44. So if I sell at, at a strike price at the option, I, I, I am said to have exercised the option. So I ask myself a question. Do I have to exercise the option? When I'm answering this question, I say, I am a borrower, so I sell. Do I sell at 95,5 or sell at 95,44? I sell at 95,5. So 95,5 is the option. So I exercise the option. You can see here I have both exercised the, the option because the strike price, which I can sell at, is higher than the closing futures price. If I then sell, I then have to make sure which profit have I made? Profit on options. Profit on options. Now the profit from options is simple. It's a matter of 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 if 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 I sell it, it's a matter of saying this one here minus this. That one 0, 0,06 and that one is 0, 0,56. Oh, this is six ticks. You now understand how I get the ticks. I just multiply that by six ticks and this is 56 ticks. 56 ticks. You divide by 0, 0,01. You divide this by the tick size. Okay. So it's it's off or if you want to express it in ticks. Now you now have outcome. Outcome. Oh, it's it's now up. It's now options on interest rate futures. Options on interest rate futures. This is the outcome on options on interest rate futures. The outcome. The outcome is just like this. What you then have to do is you say extra finance cost the ceo wants to know by how much the extra finance cost so i still have to, br to bring to the ceo's attention the extra finance cost it is still 136 and 136 we've calculated it before 136 and 136 now if we age using options this extra finance cost is reduced by profit from option. So you say less profit from options. Profit from options. So how do you calculate profit from options? The first one, it's like 58 contracts times six ticks on each tick you were gaining $25 and then the other one is 68 contracts times 56 ticks on each tick you were getting 25 I told you if you are not given the tick value you know that this 0 0.56 is 0 0.56 percent so you have to type it as 0 0.00 five six when you're punching in the calculator but if you are given the tick value is computations are made simpler equals minus six times six is eight times 25 so that's 10 200 there you say equals minus uh, 56 times six is eight times 25 95 200 then another thing on options is that for you to secure the right, you buy. So you then say, and, and, and the amount you pay is called premium. So you say premium. 
Now, this premium is paid at the beginning. You, you need to know which premium are we taking. We are taking premiums. We are choosing puts. So for 95, it's, 30, it's 3, 0.034. Remember, this is annual percentages. So if you divide this by 0, 0.01, you get 30,4 ticks. Here you get 50,8 ticks. So it will be like premium. You then say at, at 95,5. So the premium becomes 30,4 ticks. I just divide it, divide it by 0, 0,95. It's 30,4 ticks times 68 times 25. There was another way of doing it. Let me just put it to say, you could say, you could say 68 contracts times 1 million times 0, 0,0030 times 3 over 12 because these contracts are three month contracts you could you could still get the same answer that way now because this is a cost a premium is a payment so it is added to cost so you are now saying equals 68 times uh, 30 comma 4 ticks times 25 if it was a receipt, a premium would be deducted and a profit added. If it was a interest rate receipt or lending. Now, premium at 96. Then say at 96, it's how many ticks? 50,8 ticks. So you say equals 50,8 ticks times 68 contracts times 25. So you can do the, of the alternative. So you say equals 50,8 times 68 times 25. So once you have done like this, you are done with options. So this becomes the net extra finance cost that is options on interest rate futures, net extra finance cost. Simple as that. So you are done with the edging for the options. Then you can now go to caller on options. Caller on options. Or concerning caller on options, I told you what you do. If you have forgotten, there is this handout where I clearly, I clearly said it here. So let me let me not look like I'm now taking things from my head when I've given you this stuff. As you can see, I typed it myself. That's my number there. I typed it myself, and I bet said, said as long as you you commit this handout to memory, there is no question that you shall come across which will give you problems. So containing interest rate features, remember we discussed caller on options. This is caller on options. So allow me to copy as it is. If we are a borrower, this is what I said. Let me copy it and then paste it here. Right, this is a caller on options. So when I say borrowers buy, because this company, you know it. You don't say borrowers. You now say daikon. Daikon. You know, by caller, I said you are aging both interest rate increase or interest rate and in interest rate decrease. So, so what you do is, as a, as a borrower, you buy interest rate put options as before, but simultaneously, you sell call you buy interest rate put options and simultaneously sell core option, thereby paying the net premium. And I said, what do we mean by buying a put? Buying a put means securing the right to sell the futures contract at a higher strike price. 
by selling a call means securing the right to buy the futures contracts at a higher strike price or at a strike price. So if, 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 if what you simply do is, as a borrower, what you do is you buy put, buy put like this, and then simultaneously do what? Sell call. Sell call. So what are you what are we saying by this? You say strike price. These strike prices you have them. Strike prices, they are still 95,5. Take them in that order, 96. Actually, in terms of percentage, you can in terms of percentage, you can see that 95,5, it means 4,5%. 96 means 4%. So 95,5 is a higher rate. No wonder why we, we are calling it a put or a cap. And then call it 96, which is a flow. But I don't want you to, to overstretch yourself. Just take the, 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 the strike prices as they are, or the interest rates on the option. And then you say closing futures price. Closing futures price. Closing futures price, we have calculated it. We have calculated it above. Uh, it, it came out as 95,44 throughout. So closing futures price is 95,44. Now, listen to what I'm going to say now, because all this that I'm going to say, it, it boils from this, this point, which is shaded in red. If you can only understand what, what I'm going to say on the information which I have shaded in red, you will not have problems with a caller. But remember, this is a caller on borrowers. There is a caller on lenders. Lenders, they do the opposite. Lenders, they buy interest rate, call and simultaneously sell put, they buy paying or receiving the net premium. So in this case, I ask myself, do I have to exercise? Because the word caller, it's, it's, a, it's an option terminology because it, caller means put of flow and the cap and all these are option rates. Now let me let me go through this when I'm saying can I exercise? I am saying buying a put means securing the right to sell the futures contract at a strike price. So it is from this way I am going to. To, to, to choose, do I exercise? So I am saying, can I sell futures contract at 95,44 or can I sell at 95,5? Clearly, I sell at 95,5. So this I exercise, yes. Because 95,5 is high. That's what it means by buying a put. I am securing the right to sell the, intro, the, the futures at a higher one strike price and then let us go to selling a call selling a call means securing the right to buy remember call means buy futures contract at a strike price so i am asking myself can i buy at 96 or can i buy at 95,44 clearly i would rather buy at 95,44 because i have not choose the 96 which is the option i am i say i have not exercised the option because I have not chosen the option price. So no wonder you now know why I'm saying yes, no. Then you say profit from options. Profit from caller. From caller. Profit from caller on options. Profit from caller on options. Now caller on options the profit will be this minus this which is six ticks or six ticks now here there's no more profit because i haven't exercised it so i can i no longer consider the right side i'm now considering where i have exercised it because we are actually told that the, if, if the option, the assumptions that are given in the initial assumptions is that, is that 
if the options are is in the money, they will be exercised at the end of the age period instead of being sold. What it means is if it's profitable to exercise the option, exercise it. That's what it means. When, a, when an option is said to be in the money, if it is favorable to, 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 to the world to exercise it, like in this case, can I sell at 95,5 or can I sell at 95,44? I would rather sell at 95,5. So it's favorable. So we say it is in the money. So, so you can you can now see quite a lot of things there. Then you you can now say net premium. Net premium. Because this time you you can see from the information shaded in red that Daikon buys interest rate put options and simultaneously sells a core option there by paying the net premium. So if I come to the option table here, the put option is at this premium and the core option is at this premium. Remember, core is at 96, put is at 95. So the option premium on the put, I am receiving, I am paying it, but the premium on the core, I am receiving it because I'm selling a core. I am buying a put and selling a call, meaning the premium on the put, I'm, I'm paying it because I'm buying a put. But the premium on the call, I am receiving it because I'm selling a call. So it's 0 0.304 minus 0 0.223. So we are saying equals 0 0.304 minus 0 0.223 equals. So you now say equals. Um, 0, 0,304 minus 0, 0,223. So you'd, you'd notice that net premium is 0, 0,81 or, or, or 8,1 ticks. This one is payable. 8,1 ticks payable. Why is it payable? Because I am paying 3,04 and receiving 0, 0,223. So what I'm paying is more. So it's a payable premium. So the premium that we are going to consider there is 8,1 ticks. You may put it as a decimal. It will be 0, 0,00081 if you are to work it as a decimal. So you can now say outcome. Outcome. This is the outcome on caller on options. Caller on options. Outcome on caller on options. You now say, remember, we are now considering this column only where we have exercised. So you now say extra finance cost. Extra finance cost. Why are we always saying extra finance cost? Because notice, the CEO says she wants to know by how much the extra finance cost of borrowing can be reduced. So you need to know what is the extra finance cost. We calculated if interest rate increased by 80 basis points. So the extra finance cost will be the 0.8%, which is the basis point. 136, that is still the extra finance cost. And then you say profit on less profit on options less profit on options. This time it's profit on caller, from caller on options, caller on options. So the profit on caller on options, it is still this, you say equals 68 contracts times six ticks times 25. It's negative because it's a profit. And then you say premium. Uh, premium, you are now simply saying uh, equals 8,1 ticks times 68 contracts times 25. So you can see here that if you enter into a caller arrangement, you reduce the premium. No wonder why they say caller reduces the overall cost of hedging to the firm. 
because you pay the net premium. So after doing this, we now have the net extra finance cost from hedging. This is the net extra finance cost. So the net extra finance cost is this. Now, so you can see, simple as that. So if you want now to advise someone, because CEO wants to know which one is the appropriate hedging method. So this is a summary of net extra finance cost. Net extra finance cost. You now want to advise. Uh, so you now say futures edge. Futures edge. If you use interest rates, futures. The net extra finance cost, we calculated it and it came out to be we calculated it and it came out to be 68,000. So, okay, it came out to be 68. And then you say options on interest rate futures, options on interest rate, options on interest rate futures. This one, there are two strike prices. So you, you have to say at which strike price. So you say at, at 95,5, 95,5, the net extra finance cost at 95,5 was 177. Then at 96, at 96 it was net extra finance cost at 96, it was uh, it was 127 and then caller on options caller on options at 95,5 caller on options at 95,5 which we have just calculated here 139 so you want to advise the ceo now which hedging option is profitable. Remember, this is borrowing. So you'd go for the one with net lowest net extra finance cost. So you comment and conclude and you write here advice. Advice and say the futures edge edge is recommended recommended as it results in the lowest lowest uh, net extra finance cost if interest rate if interest rate increase interest rate increase by 80 basis points Eight basis points. So you can see the futures edge is the lowest. Now, if it was a receipt, it will, it wouldn't be a cost. Obviously, it will be income. So it will be extra finance extra finance income. So you would go by exercising the option at ninety five comma five because it would be of the highest income there. So that's what you do. Remember the question that we did in the last in the last last lecture we were focusing mostly on effective rates effective rate so i didn't want necessarily to to restrict your analysis to that or only i wanted to expand your analysis to know that you can as well answer a question and conclude without coming up with the issue of effective rate now mark to market process mark to market process market process this one is a source of easy marks in a question like that like this suppose you are suppose because this the, the one we had answered it 15 marks suppose you 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 were told by the examiner that is 12 minutes to go 
clearly, if it was 12 minutes to go, there was no way you would enter A, but rather you would score easy marks if you answer B, because B, you can answer it independently of A. B is saying, discuss the impact on daikon of each of the three further issues given above. As part of your discussion, include calculation of daily impact of the mark to market a closing prices on transactions specified by the CEO. So the CEO is acknowledging that uh, futures contracts are marked to market daily. And if we have purchased 50 contracts on June 1, what will be the cash flow consequences due to these closing futures prices for the first four days? And that's, that's what the CEO wants. And I told you what mark to market process goes. If you play all my videos, I deliberately did, I did it on purpose. Every question that I had chosen is an element of marking to market. Marking to market, marking to market. So what I want you to know is uh, because of that, I, I want to send the same information I always explain to you when, 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 when I was, when I'm teaching, when I was teaching. Remember I said, Futures contracts are settled on a cash basis daily. In other words, they are cash settled. And this is known as mark to market process. Let me let me copy, copy it and paste it on my on my answer tab. On my answer tab like this. And then copy again. Copy again the, 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 the rest. Copy it again like this. and then paste it on my answer tab. Why it's 10 marks, meaning everything I'm copying here and pasting, you really have to be able to answer it. Right, because, because I'm copying from a table, no wonder why the font is, is acted up like this, but it's still fine. It's like this. Futures contracts are cash settled on a daily basis. Actually, what you need to know is, Futures, it's a market, it's, a, it's, an, it's an exchange traded market. It's, it's a stock exchange, meaning they are exchange traded derivatives. Meaning this market opens in the morning and closes, and closes at the end of the day. Oh, sorry, let me answer this. The market opens in the morning and closes at the end of the day. And, and as it does so, you, you either make a profit or a loss depending on the movement in exchange rate, or in this case, movement in interest rate. The interest rate may move adversely, so there's a, a loss for you for that day. If it moves favorably, there's a profit. So what do they do, the futures uh, clearing houses or the brokers? Well, on the day you get to the futures market, they ask you to open a, a, a margin account, which is a bank account. And this is a bank account. Like like an ordinary, but this in this this margin account, it's the the, the, the transactions they in are regulated. So if you so if you be told to deposit a certain amount in the margin account, and this reflects the risk exposure you are facing. You get that as the positions are closed each day, as you close your position, if you have made a profit, it is credited to the margin account. If you have made losses, it will be debited from your margin account. So normally the clearing houses will set a minimum margin balance, which is called a maintenance level. It's like a minimum bank balance for your bank. You know, if your, if your bank balance falls below the minimum, you will receive a call from your bank to deposit additional money. So the same, the analog is the same with futures contracts. If your margin balance falls below the maintenance level, perhaps because you are, you are incurring persistent losses, persistent daily, persistent daily losses, so that your margin balance is being reduced below the minimum or maintenance level. The broker will call you and ask you to deposit additional funds into the margin account to bring your balance to the initial or to bring your balance to the maintenance level. And this process, uh, is, 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 we, we call it margin call. And the process of getting your pro daily profits or daily losses is called mark to market daily so so that's that's basically what mark to market process works so so mark to market process on selected 
transactions. Mark to market process. Mark to market process on uh, for uh, from let's say from one to four June on fifty contracts. On fifty contracts, they're saying, can you tell us how the mark to market process works from one to four June on fifty contracts? So. It, it, it's like your margin account is like a bank account, remember? This is margin account. It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's kind of a bank account, so to speak. So what they do in the margin account is there is a day or date, and then there is details, details and then there is debit, there is credit and then there is balance. Balance is important because so when once you get there, suppose you get on 1 June, they will ask you to deposit money, which is called initial margin. This is this is charged the contract that you have opened. Margin. So we, we are not told the initial margin, so this becomes your opening balance, obviously. If we were told it's so much per contract, because you've got 50 contracts, so you say 50 contracts multiplied by that amount, so that you know how much you must pay as initial margin. And then on the same date here, you, you bought these contracts, notice, you bought you you on the same day you bought them at 95,84 and then the closing price was the closing price so this is the settlement price here now notice you are you not seeing here the, 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 you are being told that you you got to the market you bought it 95,84 it means you then sell at 95,76 to close the market. You sell at 95,76. You buy at 95,84 and sell at 95,76. So this one is a loss. So this day we can call it 1 slash 1 slash 2 June. You, 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 you bought these at 95 84 and then you are selling it 95,76. Remember, when you close the day you sell by to close your you close your position on the opposite side. If you open by selling, you close by buying. If you open by buying, you close by selling. So here we are told that the, the positions were opened by buying at 95,84. So they close by selling. So on this day there was a loss. So you say loss, loss equals. So the loss is 95. 84 minus it's 95,84 minus 95,76 and this loss is equal to 8 ticks 8 it's, it's actually you, you can you can get it as 0, 0,08 which is equal to 8 ticks divided by the tick size times 50 contracts, 80 ticks times 50 contracts, and on each tick, you are losing $25. You are losing $25. So I can I can make my, 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 so loss will be debited. So to say eight times 50 times 25. So the loss will be debited into your margin account. You're getting that? So it's money coming out of your margin account. Then there is day uh, two, three. On the day, on day two and three, you opened the day. You know, the closing for day two, the closing for day one is opening for day two. So you opened it 95,76 and you close it. So you by open, because you closed it by selling, you open by buying. So you are opening by 95, you are buying by 90, 95,76 and closing at 95,66. So it's another loss of 10 ticks. So 
you say day two slash three June, two slash three June, or you say details here, loss, loss. So you opened it 95, comma, seven, six, and 95, comma, seven, six. And then you are now selling at the end of the day at 95, comma, six, six. So are you not seeing? You are, you, are, you are making losses. So this is 0, 0,1, which is 10 ticks. 10 ticks times 50 contracts times 25. So again, it's a debit equals 10 multiplied by 50 multiplied by 25. So that's how they will be maintaining your margin account. So as, as a... As a broker, they will have what is called maintenance level, meaning as your as, as we are having your running balance here. As we are having your running balance here, it means they if your running balance falls below what is called maintenance level, they will then say deposit additional money. What causes your margin balance to fall below maintenance level is the issue of these daily persistent losses. Are you getting it? Now, how do some now here is how others attempt to prevent these persistent losses? They will then say, "Oh well, for the past two days it appears these contracts are are not on my side. Already I have lost 22, 22,500 two days alone." So what people normally do is they then sell some of the contracts to minimize daily losses. So this is what Daikon does so they are saying they are saying and and 30 contracts were sold for 95.61 on 3 june so on the same date which is 3 june daikon then decided to to after realizing that it is just a, having losses 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 it then realized it, it then decided to sell 30 contracts but you can't sell these 30 contracts at a price above 95,66 because no one will buy them because everyone knows that you are having losses over the past two days. So you have to discount them. So it's another loss. Their price is 95,66, but you said, well, I can't continue with these contracts tomorrow. Let me sell them. But because they have been making losses, they are not attractive. So you discount to 95,61. So this is what Daikon does. It then discounts to 95, 6, 1. So what you then do is you say 3 June, 3 June, say loss on contract sold, loss on contracts sold. Now the contract sold where price was 95,66, but they to sell at 95,61 because they are not attractive. So the loss equals five ticks, five ticks times 30 contracts. We only sold 30 contracts times $25. So it's another loss, it's a debit, equals five times 30 times 25, which is 3750. And now let us now have the, the information on three slash four June. Three slash four June, the situation is now like this. You bought in the morning, meaning remember closing price for three June is the opening price on four June. So you bought at 95,66 and then you close by selling at 95,74. So there's a profit now. Are you not seeing the firm was going to benefit more if it had not sold the 30 contracts yesterday? But because it was fearing persistent losses, it sold the 30 contracts. But yet it did not sold the 30 contracts yesterday. It was going to recover its losses on those 30 contracts. But now it's only left with the 20 contracts. So we now have profit of 74 minus 66, which is 8. So it's a matter of 8 ticks uh, times 20 contracts which are left. So it's now profit on this day, which is... 96, 95,74 minus 95,66, which is 8, eight, eight ticks 
times 20 contracts. It's, it's now left with 20 contracts times 25. So this will be credited to your margin account because 8 times 20 contracts times 25,000. So your margin account will be monitored so that it is not falling below the maintenance. Whenever it falls below the maintenance, it will be stipulated here. On your margin account, they, they, they stipulate right on the top to say maintenance level equals maintenance. So that there is no debate, maintenance level, maintenance level equals. There won't be any debate. So you'll be given, it, it is like, so you you be you be checking whenever it is below the maintenance level they will ask you to deposit that deficit to bring it to the maintenance level so this is how mark to market process works and you could have scored how many marks here for 10 marks by explaining the mark to market process to the examiner so you'd 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 score your 10 marks hi right, lawrence how are you Lawrence, well, say, how are you? Can you I'm, say how are you? I'm doing great. Uh, I'm doing great. Are you are, are you actually understanding the concept that you say is saying? Yes, I am. Sir. I'm actually understanding. Okay, perfect. You you joined uh, you joined for how many minutes? Uh, it's now almost uh, an hour. Just started with you from this side. Ah, okay, okay, perfect. And these are the concepts I really want you to, as I have said, these are the concepts I really want you to grasp. Um, there is a video which I had which, in my monologue video. You know, those videos I'm just lecturing. I'm just discussing a paper on my own without students, which I did about six days ago, which is March, March 2020 question paper. Make sure you play that it's accessible in our WhatsApp class group. May you scroll back, you'll see it, and make sure you play it. But in that video, I also explained issues of mark to market process, this time using uh, current futures. So the mark to market processes that you have been used to to date, they were mark to market process on current futures. Uh, I, I was yet to do a mark to market process on interest rate options. So this is the purpose, the main purpose I had to do this particular question so that you would understand the mark to market process on interest rate. And of particular interest in this paper is the issue of caller on options. You know, you have, you have realized from this uh, illustration that caller is the easiest of all. But to, for you to get the day, to get it right on color on options, it all boils down to what I was saying on this part here, on this part which is shaded in red, because this part which is shaded in red is the one which helped me to put this with yes or no. For example, am I I'm saying can I exercise the option or not? I need to know what does it mean to say buying a put. So I come to the notes, I say buying a put means securing the right to sell futures contracts at a strike price. So I am asking myself, can I sell this futures contract at 95,44 or at 95,5? Because I have a right for that. So I realized that it would be beneficial to sell it at 95,5. Because 95,5 is the strike price of the option, I am said to have exercised the option. No wonder why I said yes there. And then selling a call means what? Selling a call means securing the right to buy, because call means buy, futures contracts at a strike price. So I'm asking myself, do I have to buy at 95,44 or buy at 95,6? I mean at 96. I would, I would rather buy at 95,44 because it's cheaper. Now, because 95,44 is not the strike price, it's, or it's not the option but the futures, I am said not to have exercised the option because I haven't gone for 96. So I let the option lapse, so to speak, because the option strike price is not favorable. 
So this is what it, what it means by selling a call. So this is call on option to a bit to a firm which is which is borrowing. If it was a lender, similar steps apply, but you do, you do simply do the, 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 okay? Because you may know it like this, and the examiner just puts a lender there, and the marks are still in some little wording. And you, 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 I, what I don't want is a situation where you then panic. No, notice I'm just coming to the end out because I believe in this end out. So if you come across a question and you feel like, well, do we have or any, anything of this sort in the end? Look, you say I always come back to the end out because it's all encompassing. So if it was a lender, it says lenders buy interest rate call option and simultaneously sell put option, thereby paying or receiving the net premium. So if it was for a lender, I would say here, buy call and sell put. Uh, let me take this and then consider it to be a lender. It's now, sec it's now outside the answer to this question. It's now secondary explanation. Let me copy this and then, uh, and then paste it somewhere underneath. Paste it somewhere underneath. Right. Let me just paste values. Paste special values and number formatting. Okay, so if it was a lender, what would you do? A lender, you say you buy call. A lender buys call and then sells put. Simple as that. A lender, you 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 lender a lender enters the market by call side when it when you are borrowing money. You are borrowing money. You buy, you borrow money. By, I mean, you lend money by buying. You lend money by buying, and buying is a call. You don't lend by selling. So notice, I want to 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 put this off here, and then I ask myself, here is where you need to pay attention. I need to know what is what does it mean by buying a call? Buying a call means securing securing the right to buy at strike price. So I ask myself, can I buy at 95,5 or can I buy at 95,44? I would rather buy at 95,44 because 95,44 is cheaper. So because 95,44 is not the strike price, I say I don't exercise the option. In other words, I let the open lapse because the strike price is not favored. And then selling a put means securing the right to sell the futures contract at strike price. So I say, can I sell it at 95,44 or can I sell it at 96? I would rather sell it at 96 because it's a higher price. So in so doing, I exercise the option because I go for the option price. This is what you arrange a caller on lenders and then proceed as before. Simple as that, simple as that. So always, we, we always want, want to do this. No, now I'm, what I want to do because of time, I, I have an SBO lecture which is coming. I need, you know, SBO, I need to read the cases and all those myriad of exhibits, close to 12 pages before 5.30, so that I will be able to teach in the next um, three hours. So what I'm going to do is, as you know, I, when I come across questions and I'll be teaching, I need to send you a video on swaps. I have it somewhere, I'll fish it out. If I don't, I just find a question and teach you on swaps. Interest rate swap, because you may play, you may find it in my Facebook or YouTube. Interest rate swap is basically exchange of underlying exposures between the two parties. We, 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 what you are exchanging is the interest rate. You get that? One part might be facing a variable interest rate and another part might be facing, having a fixed interest rate. And by swapping, we are saying this party pays the fixed for this one and this one pays the variable for this one. An important factor is what is variable is the liable. It's there in the end out here. I, 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 I have put the, the the illustrative question for a swap. Only that there's no video doesn't mean that 
Well, I mean, it's not the talking about what I'm what, I, what I'm talking about here. So you can see here, this is the question on interest rate swaps that I gave you. One of it, I I I I, I did quite a lot of working, so I I will make a follow up with a video, or I can fish it out uh, in my in my. I will, fish out, I will fish out the video in my, but please, you can access it from that end out. Please read. I gave the explanations I'm giving you that when we are saying you are swapping the variable rate, what you are swapping is the LIBOR. You are saying one part should pay your LIBOR and you pay the fixed rate for the other party. That's basically it. And then you may say, where do we get to know each other as counterparties in a swap arrangement? Normally, a bank will you can arrange the swap contract for you, can, can create a meeting place for the parties with different interest rate exposures. And for arranging that particular swap contract, you pay the bank commission. So if you if you parties benefit, say, by 2% interest rate or 200 basis points, being your total benefit from the swap arrangement, there is, there is a, there's an agreement on how these benefits are to be shared. So if you are to share equal, your interest rate exposure will reduce by 1% because the benefit was 200 basis points. My interest rate will also reduce by 1%. Remember, these are annualized rates. Remember to time apportion them if the loan is for six months. And then if the bank which arranges the swap requires a commission before you split the benefits, what you simply do, you then say 2% minus the commissions. If the commission is 40 basis points, which is 0.4%, it means you are now left with net benefits of 1.6. And these are then shared according to predetermined formula. If the formula was 50-50, it means you, you then benefit 0.8% and the other part is 0.8% net of intermediation commission and then what is the meaning of this 0.8 percent which is your net benefit it means your overall interest exposure is going to be reduced by 0.8 percent on the nominal amount which was swapped i will send the video for this and expect to receive it but in the meantime play work uh, can you com perform computations that i have put across in my in my handout and I understand everyone, I, I, at the beginning of this lecture, I emphasized on the need for assignments for CBE mocks. Uh, don't, don't say after doing CBE mocks, you rush to mock, after doing mock one, you rush to mock two. No, 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 no. You identify knowledge gaps. Can you play debriefing videos on CBE mock number one? If you realize that there are areas where you lack, don't jump to mock number two do as many questions as possible in the BPP or Kaplan Vision Kit. If you feel like going playing your sales videos, I have plenty of those videos and I have plenty of revision videos and this is even one of the revision videos you, 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 you have to play. You have to play. And I have a feeling that the video for March 2020 question paper, which I monologued three days ago, is yet to be played in full because the question number two is the one I really want you to grasp in that video, especially the computation of basis between spot price and futures price, considering that the, the spot price was given in euros and futures price in dollars. So you do notice in that video, I said you can't subtract euros from dollars. You need to convert the spot price given in euros to dollars for you to deduct the futures price, which is in dollars, to get the basis. If you haven't gotten that part right, can you go back to that video? It's obtainable in our WhatsApp class or still on my YouTube channel. It's AFM Revision, March 20 question paper, 2020 question paper, so that you bring yourself up to speed. You have to relax. AF, AFM is very easy. Can you imagine, you as my students, from the first time I started teaching you AFM to date, you have never seen me reading anything. You have never seen me with any textbook or anything. I was just saying AFM from day one to date. And I say it like I'm saying stories like this. I do, I'm saying this to inspire you. No matter your persuasions or preconceived ideas about the subject, there's no substitute to question practice. 
Make sure you practice as many questions as possible. As a general rule, don't get to the exam without completing revision kits. Because if you ask, if you ask me, you say, can you imagine I teach about, in total, the subjects that I teach personally, there are 28 subjects. CFA, I teach all the 18 modules, study sessions or subjects. CIMA, I teach about five. A, this CCA, you know, look on my YouTube channel and see the videos, the subjects I teach, quite plenty. But all of you, for 28 subjects, you are writing and completing syllabus in three months. For 28 subjects, I know all the revision kits by head. Imagine I went through all questions in every revision, not just ACCA, CIMA, CFA, every revision kit. I know all the questions that you can just pick any question and ask. I can tell you from wherever I am, whether I'm at the bar or, or what, I can answer. But I don't have an exam. And then I ask you to do just one revision kit. And up to now, you haven't yet to figure out how to complete it. Are you not seeing you are out of sync with your say? Under the circumstances, in terms of commitment and everything, you'll be out of sync. So this is like a whipping exercise. I'm whipping you into the issue so that you get yourself to know that failure is not an option. On that note, enjoy the rest of your evening. You need, you need to replay this video once it is streamed. As soon as I'm done, my guys will stream it. So you shall see the link as usual. Cheers, guys. Bye. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. So, so once again,